The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning and welcome. There it is. <laughs> Good morning and welcome to worship on this day. It's kind of a big day uh, with Chalk the Walk. It's been a lovely weekend. Um, it's also Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, I don't know. What, is there an appropriate greeting for Cinco de Mayo? Ole. Ole. <laughs> Feliz Cinco de Mayo. Um, it is also in the Wonder Bonewald House. It is baseball, our first baseball tournament. And uh, Teddy just finished a game. It will be the last game he will play today because his team lost. So <sighs> please pray for the Mount Vernon nine and under baseball team. It was a rough tournament. So we'll be working on resilience at our house. Um, it is also a communion Sunday, and uh, so we won't, uh, I thought we was a joyful occasion, but it also means we won't have our usual time of sharing of joys and concerns. So if you have one that you'd like to share, and I encourage you to do that now. I want to say thank you to Ed Bjork for stepping up to be a liturgist this morning. Zane Marshall was going to do it, but has gotten caught up in getting ready to graduate from Cornell next weekend. So Ed took over and appreciate that. Um, so that also means we won't be able to celebrate Zane's graduation, but we will celebrate Chris Cannon. Um, one, um, I just, I wanted to lift up for the congregation, the Osterman family, Shane and Jackie and their children, um, Isaiah and Ellie, they've been worshiping with us since November. Um, they are in Washington, D.C. They flew there yesterday uh, because uh, Ellie and Zay both have uh, PKU, which is a short for a long term. It has to do with, the, um, I think, one out of, what, 10,000 children? People are, are, are born, humans are born with this, and it's an inability to process certain um, proteins, and it can cause um, mental Dishealth. I mean, it's just uh, retardation. Um, but if it's identified, and, and kids have the blood test at, at birth to identify this, um, and they have to eat a special diet, avoiding gluten, avoiding all protein, just anyway, it's, it's a big deal. Uh, their, their family has been able to, to manage it, but it is also very expensive, and um, insurance won't cover the cost of the special food. It's kind of dumb. but. Sadly, we've come to expect that. <laughs> uh, but they are on Capitol Hill. They are going to advocate this week. They're going to meet with legislators. The Medical Nutrition Equity Act was introduced in the House on Friday. Um, and so they're going to be talking to people and looking for co-sponsors. And so I invite you to join me in praying for uh, ears to hear and spines to stand up and co-sponsor and do what needs to be done. Lord, for justice, right? That's just in so many ways. But just we'll start with this justice in this this little slice of the pie. So, Lord, in your mercy. Your All right. Are there any other joys and concerns besides baseball teams? And uh, can you just thank Carl for the steps? Yes. Thank you to Carl and Beth for for fixing the steps. Uh, the, our poor little blue, one of the blue steps <coughs> lost its smile, but it's looking better. <laughs> you got a little, like a chipped tooth. I thought it was a chipped tooth. Yes. Or was there more? Because I didn't see it. I came up. Yeah. The painter's tape. Painter's tape. I want to run right out and look at that. Hey. Yeah, painter's tape blue. It looks good. We'll take it. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hello. My mom at 97 passed away, and I wanted to thank um, the cards that came and the um, um, phone calls that came, and also some text to my flip phone. Yeah. So, Aww, <laughs> so one of the last things mom said, wh whispered, was um, I had six beautiful babies Aww. and then I think the very last thing she said I want to go to Norway <laughs> so, no, anyway, so thank you everybody for your words and thanks be to God for your mom's life 
and all the goodness and truth that passed through her life and to so many others. Yeah. Anybody else have a, have a joy or a concern to share today? I'm also going to mention just one more. Uh, uh, has anybody ever heard of Rachel Held Evans? Yeah, she, um, 37 years old, um, she, I don't know, about a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, went into, um, was, was placed in a medically induced coma after her brain started having seizures after an infection. Rachel, um, and she, she died yesterday morning, uh, and it is just a tragedy. Rachel was raised in the Southern Baptist tradition. Her father was um, a big part of that, and Rachel's just one of the smartest people in the world and most faithful, and she, she came out of that and kept asking questions and created a safe space for other people who were questioning the frankly patriarchal way of looking at faith that they were in very cut and dried way that they were looking at faith and she made space um, through, uh, through her blog and several books that she wrote for people to, um, to ask questions and to know that it was okay to doubt and uh, she, yeah, if you are on social media, check out the hashtag because of RHE, it is really moving, people are writing tributes to her and how much she meant to them in the life of faith. Um, yeah, she was just a, a great inspiration, one of those people that I like to read anytime a big issue in faith and in the, in, in the Big C Church community came up, I like to see what Rachel had to say. And she leaves her husband Dan and two small children. I know her daughter is just about a year old and she has a son who's maybe three or four and it's just, that's horrible. It's just a horrible, horrible thing and there are a lot of people who are who are hurting because of her presence. So, anyway, my heart was very, <laughs> I was one of those people who was very sad yesterday. So, uh, for Rachel and all who loved her, Lord, in your mercy. Okay. I think maybe that's good. We're all coming in here. I had, uh, Teddy's game has ended, so I no longer have a part of my heart in a baseball field. Uh, I'm here now, um, but perhaps you, like me, entered in with all sorts of things on your hearts and minds, and um, so I invite you to just take a moment and breathe. We are in this series, in the season of Easter, which is seven weeks, 50 days long, from Easter Sunday to Pentecost Sunday. We are invited in this time especially to remember that we are made a new creation. If anyone is in Christ, we are a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life is here. And there's new life. This is an ongoing process, maybe even whenever we stop and take a deep breath and remember who we are and whose we are. So, as a reminder that we are reminded that we are new creations in Christ, let us continue our worship of God together. for the call to worship. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Everywhere we look, we see new life. Seeds and buds, 
in smiles and touch, we experience God's life-giving presence. Death can never be the last world. Christ has raised Jesus from the dead. Christ is present among us today. Praise God for new life within and among us this day. Amen. possibilities. We confess that we do not always perceive the opportunities we place before us. We get caught up in our own goals, plans, and fantasies, and trip over our doubts, fears, and disappointments. We are slow to recognize the invitations and openings you set before us. in Christ is a new creation. The old life is gone. The new life has begun. Know that in Jesus, God embraces us, forgives us, and strengthens us to live in renewed life. Thanks be to God. Peace be with you. Jesus stands among us. Peace be with you. The risen Lord is here. What did you say? Oh, you have to tell me if you like that. I invite uh, any other children to join me up front. I'm sorry, Teddy isn't here. Yeah, yeah. Buddy, missing your buddy. I'm not. He thinks it's kind of fascinating to miss church on Sundays. <laughs> it's not used to that. Um, 
Good morning. Are you guys having a good weekend? Anybody uh, get chalky yesterday? Did you? Good. Oh, you you did. It's like an ombre effect right there. That looks really good. That's very you're very fashionable to have that on there. Well, um, I uh, we're talking today about um, follow uh, people who. Um, who decide to follow Jesus. And there is a story, you know, we talk about the disciples a lot, but there is a guy named Paul, and he has a really interesting story. And so I thought that I might share that story with you today. There are actually, each Sunday, if we follow the Revised Common Lectionary, there are four readings that we could do from the Bible every Sunday. And we usually only do one. Um, but this is one that we didn't do, and I almost chose it because it's such a great story. So Paul's name wasn't always Paul. He was born, and his name was Saul. And Saul lived at the time of Jesus, and then he lived at the time just right after Jesus. And he, he like Jesus, was, was a Jew, and he was a very good Jew. He believed very much, he loved God, and he very much believed that the Jewish way, in fact, I think he was a, we think he was a Pharisee, and he, he, he really wanted people to follow the law exactly as it said, and he did not appreciate these followers of Jesus who came, they, they still worshiped at the synagogue, but they just, you know, they, they, they believed a little bit differently, and he did not like that, and so he actually, it made him so mad. Does it ever make you mad when people don't do things the right way? or the way you think they're supposed to be doing them. I, I admit to having that problem. But Paul would, um, he actually would work with the authorities and he was working on having these people thrown out of the synagogue, whoops, sorry, and arrested. And um, he even at one point, there was, a, there was a, a follower of Jesus named Stephen. And Stephen was arrested and, and put on trial for his beliefs and, and they actually, um, they killed him. And, and Saul was standing by and going, yep, that's the right thing, that's the right thing to do, right? So this is the way, this is the way Saul was. So Saul was um, on the road to this place called Damascus, and um, he had this very interesting experience where all of a sudden this bright light blinded him, and um, so here's, here is one artist's representation of this event. And he fell to the ground, he was totally blind, and he heard this voice saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he believed that that was Jesus' voice. And um, Saul was totally helpless. He couldn't, um, he couldn't go anywhere. He couldn't get anywhere. Do you know what the word persecute means, by the way? I realize that's a big word. Do you know what persecute means? Accuse, yeah, you accuse someone of something, and then you, like, attack them for it, either verbally or sometimes, you know, physically. Right? Okay? So, you know, why are you, why are you hurting me and my followers? That's what that was about. So, uh, Saul kind of uh, went, went away by himself for, uh, for several days and um, was praying, and then he, uh, and his heart was changed. And he decided that he was going to follow Jesus. And so he changed from this guy who was going around and um, going after people who were, at that point they weren't really called Christians, they were called people of the way. Because there was a way that you were supposed to live. And, and, a, and, a way, and so they were people of the way. And so then he became one of, the, one of the folks who lived that way. Now, if you were one of the more original people of the way, and you heard that this guy who had hurt your friends and you had been afraid of was suddenly on your side, would you believe it? No. It took a while for people to trust Paul. Well, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention. And he, he changed his name to Paul. He had this new identity. He was a new creation in Christ. And he became... Um, I really meant to bring a Bible to show you how many letters. So, so the New Testament has four Gospels and one history book and then a whole bunch of letters. And most of those were written by Paul. So he, he ended up really forming the Christian faith and our understanding. And Paul believed very much that 
he shouldn't just um, tell the good news about Jesus to other Jews, but he should really tell that good news to people who were not Jewish. And so it was Paul that was really the first missionary going out and telling, telling people about Jesus and teaching people how to love one another and how to love God. So uh, he was pretty important. All right, we're done with that one. It was a scintillating story, wasn't it? I always thought it was kind of fascinating, this whole Paul being blinded and, and yeah, anyway. Uh, but everybody, we have these really flashy stories about following Jesus, right? People who totally gave their lives and changed things entirely. But I think most of us aren't called to do that. Most of us are just called to do little things like being kind to new kids at school and um, choosing not to gossip and, you know, or, or tell, tell stories about somebody that you've heard um, that may or may not be true. And just choosing to be kind when others maybe are being mean or standing up for someone when they're getting picked on. Just saying, no, that's really not the right thing to do. That is, I mean, that takes a lot of courage, but it's a small act. And those are some of the most important ones that we can do in, our, in the way that we follow Jesus. So that's what I want to encourage you to do. You, you probably are not going to have a um, blinding light on your way to school one morning, but you can decide to live in Jesus' way by just choosing to be kind and loving other people. So I hope you will do that, okay? So let's, uh, let's say pretzel prayer. You can repeat after me. Thank you for the world so sweet. Thank you for the world so sweet. Thank you for the friends we meet. Thank you for the friends we meet. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you for the birds that sing. Thank you, God, for everything. Thank you, God, for everything. Amen. And we thank God for you guys. So go on and uh, I think Elena is down in the nursery for one more day and then she's gone for the summer. Bye-bye. <laughs> or you can hang out up here if you want to. Right? In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So uh, our, our reading today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 21. And it is most of chapter 21. Just an interesting little uh, tidbit here. I think this is interesting. Um, if, you, if you were to open the Gospel of John and look, the chapter 20, uh, which contains... Um, I think I've got this right. It's always something to stand up in front of people and say something to make yourself doubt what you're about to say is true. But I believe that chapter 20 has the appearance of Jesus to Mary Magdalene um, and then to the disciples in the closed room, in that locked up room, and then the story of um, Thomas not believing what his fellow disciples told him that they had seen the Lord until he saw Jesus for it with his own eyes. And then uh, there's this little paragraph that says, and there are Jesus appeared many other times, and there's more than we could fit into a book. And it sounds like it's the end. And then we have this story. And it's one of my favorites, and I'm glad that uh, whoever tacked it on to the end of what already had an ending uh, did, because it's a wonderful, wonderful story. So Jesus appears to seven disciples and, uh, who have gone fishing, and then they have breakfast on the beach. So I invite you to listen for God's word to you. Later, Jesus himself appeared again to his disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. That's another word for Sea of Galilee. That's their, it's an interchangeable name. So they have returned to Galilee. This is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons, that's James and John, and two other disciples were together. Simon Peter told them, They said, We'll go with you. They set out in a boat, but throughout the night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples didn't realize it was Jesus. Jesus called to them. Children, have you caught anything to eat? They answered him, no. 
cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they did. And there were so many fish that they couldn't haul in the net. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his coat around himself, for he was naked, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they weren't far from shore, only about 100 yards. When they landed, they saw a fire there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon Peter got up and pulled the net to shore. It was full of large fish, 153 of them. Yet the net hadn't torn, even with so many fish. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. None of the disciples could bring themselves to ask him, Who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they finished eating, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. Jesus asked a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. He asked a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was sad that Jesus asked him a third time, do you love me? He replied, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. I assure you that when you were younger, you tied your own belt and walked around wherever you wanted. When you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and another will tie your belt and lead you where you don't want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. After saying this, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God.
Thank you, choir and Julia. That was lovely. If you, um, do you guys get the reference for follow? Because it's Ruth who tells her mother-in-law, <laughs> Naomi, <laughs> that I will follow you wherever you, I mean, essentially I'm paraphrasing, but I will follow you wherever you go. So. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So do, we have, do any of you love to go fishing or have you ever loved to go fishing? Or we have a few, a few people that like to go fishing? Okay, not a lot, not, okay. Um, have any of you been fishing at night, like the disciples? Okay, okay, I've, okay. Like how late at night? Like, like, like all night? Wow, that's okay. That's because I, I, you know, my grandfather was quite the fisherman, and he would he would get up at the crack of dawn and go. But I had not really heard of people going out at night because apparently that's the best time to fish. Bear fishing you do at night with lanterns. Taking the carp out of the lake because they eat the good fish. Ah, so, okay. The wealth of knowledge about fishing in this room is great. Thank you. Okay. Well, I, I, I love this story. I've said that before, but I, I really, this is just one of my favorite stories. Um, and just as a reminder about where we are in the sequence, because let's see, this is the third Sunday of Easter. So on April 21st, just two whole Sundays ago, how did we count that? Three Sundays ago or two, do we count? If we don't count today, two Sundays ago was the story of, of the resurrection. And then the next week, um, we were uh, after the resurrection in, in Acts. And now we're after, after Pentecost even. And now uh, today, we're back before Pentecost. So we've kind of been all over the place. But... Um, it's, uh, and, and it's really important to, to know where we are in the sequence of events with this story um, because it, it has, it plays, bears, bears, bears much on, on what's happening. So um, I think John mentions that this was the third appearance. So before this, you know, Peter and the other disciples, um, they had the experience of seeing the risen Lord and, uh, and this was huge, right? They certainly didn't expect it. It was earth-shaking, but it was also bewildering because um, what were they supposed to do? What comes next? You know, now what? They had left their lives to follow Jesus around. Now Jesus isn't there to follow around, so... Now what? Um, I think it's fair to say that Peter, James, and John and the other disciples did not know what to do with themselves. Um, they didn't know what was expected of them. And uh, I, don't, I don't know about you, but so, so what do you, when you don't know what to do with yourself, when you just do not know what you're supposed to do, what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? I know for me, I'll, I'll grab onto something I'm pretty good at. It's usually baking. <laughs> um, like, you know, that's, that's how I got through the six weeks of interminable winter when we were stuck at home. I baked, right? Because um, I'm pretty good at it. I'm comfortable with it. I enjoy doing it. I feel like I know what I'm doing. Um, and so that's exactly what Peter did, right? He, he did not know what to do with himself. So he went back to what he knew. He decided to go fishing. That's what he'd been doing. That's how, what he was raised doing. And that's what he was doing when Jesus found him. So he went back to the beginning. And the other disciples decided to go with him. Um, James and John had also been fisher people before that. Um, the other four, we don't, we don't really know. Um, but they, so they go out in the boat. They go back to what they knew. And... Uh, they fished all night, and they caught nothing. 
There are a gazillion details in this story. We can't even get to all of them because, well, you, we would miss all of Chalk the Walk if we talked about every single <laughs> detail in the story. But, but this is one of those details that just gets me, right? That, that they fish all night and they catch nothing. Because here Peter is trying to figure out what's next. So he turns to his old standby, his, his kind of safe place, as you will, and he comes up empty. Not a single fish. I mean, can you imagine? He was already bummed and kind of, you know, anchorless. So he goes back to what he thinks he knows to do. Can you imagine how discouraged and depressed Peter must have been at that moment? You know? So it's daybreak. This is the time when they stop fishing. I'm sure they're just getting ready to say, okay, that's it. And they see this guy on the shore who, who calls at them and offers them a bit of advice. Try the other side of the boat. To which I'm sure they're like, what? But they have nothing to lose, so they do it. And they catch 153 large fish. Another detail we won't go into. And then there's this strange episode that we also won't go into about Peter putting on clothes and jumping into the water. But um, yeah, okay, let's just get, let's get to what I want to look at, I want to talk about, and that is the, the, the conversation between Peter and Jesus. So the commentaries that I have read up to this point in my life have traditionally interpreted Jesus asking Peter three times, Peter, do you love me, as Jesus offering... Peter forgiveness for the three times that Peter denied knowing Jesus uh, on the night when Jesus was arrested. Have you all heard that too? Yeah. And it's, you know, that's good. There's a nice symmetry there, you know, three and three. Um, well, this week I, I came across another understanding of it, and I, I just, it just, I really, really like it. So allow me to share with you. Um, it comes from Caroline Lewis, who is a, a professor up at Luther Seminary in St. Paul, and she is a huge fan of John's gospel. Um, and she offers a different interpretation. She writes, nowhere in the story does Jesus utter the words, I forgive you. This is true. Because Peter hasn't done anything deserving of Jesus' forgiveness. No, the person who needs to forgive Peter is, well, Peter himself. So Peter had kind of screwed up that night, right? That night of Jesus' death. Except that he had acted in a way that uh, was entirely human and that Jesus expected, right? Jesus had warned him, had told him, this is what's going to happen. And Jesus loved him in that moment when he said those words, right? Jesus never stopped loving Peter, had accepted that this was what was going to happen. I think, I think it isn't too much to say that Peter had, or Jesus had already forgiven Peter for being Peter, right? So, it, so does, it, I mean, does it make sense to you to say that there was nothing, as far as Jesus was concerned, there was nothing to forgive Peter for from that? So what Peter needs, though, and this we understand, right? This makes perfect sense. Peter needs to forgive himself. Yeah? Who is the hardest person to forgive? Me. Right? And, and I think this is what Caroline Lewis and, uh, would, would say is the, is the point of the story. Peter also needs to accept what Jesus needs him to be, which is an essential component in the now what of the resurrection. Okay? The, 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 what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to be in light of the resurrection? And so, and so here is where, where Peter gets his answer. Um, so we're going to take a big step back for just a second. Each of the four Gospels has their own spin, their own angle, their own way of telling the story, and they have certain things that they want to emphasize about Jesus and what um, he and his life and, and witness and resurrection and all of it mean for our lives today. Um, so one of the central points of John's Gospel is this question of identity. Um, 
that's part of the reason why in John's gospel we have Jesus saying, making uh, seven I am statements. The I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the door for the sheep, I am the good shepherd, I am the resurrection and the life, I am the way, the truth, and the life, I am the vine. All right, this is, this is, John is famous for these things, I am. Now, each of the gospels tells the story of Peter's denial of Jesus. Um, again, they each tell it slightly differently. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, when bystanders say, you were with him, weren't you? Peter responds by saying, I do not know him. But Caroline Lewis pointed out that in John, when Peter is, is, a, um, Peter is asked, not were you, not the statement you were with him, but you are one of his followers. And he says, his response is, I am not. I don't know, but okay, that blew my mind. I had not noticed that before. I'm such a Bible geek. That totally blew my mind when I read that. It's about identity. Who are you? I am not one of Jesus' followers. Peter denies not just knowing Jesus. Peter denies who he is who he himself is. For John, that was the heart of his denial, his denial of his own identity. That was the big deal, not that he had betrayed Jesus, but that he had, in a sense, betrayed himself. So with his series of three questions, Jesus gives Peter the chance to affirm that Peter loves him, and Jesus gives him an identity. Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, be the shepherd. I am the good shepherd, and I need you to take care of my beloved sheep for me, with me, through me. Isn't that kind of awesome? Is anybody else geeking out about this? I just was like, wow, that's so cool. Peter got so much then breakfast that morning, after the fishing expedition, he got himself back. Caroline Lewis again. Denying our identity is an all too often reality. We deny who we are because we worry that we won't meet expectations. We deny who we are because we are afraid to disappoint. We deny who we are because we could be judged, even rejected, for that truth. We deny who we are because we do not believe that we will be liked for who we truly are, or that we will be loved for who we truly are. We play it safe around a lot of people in our lives, pretending, and rightly so. Not everyone deserves our truth. Not everyone can be trusted with our truth. And if this is the way we feel with people in our lives, even those closest to us, I suspect the same would be true of our relationship with Jesus. And I will just extemporaneously add this right here about that denial of who we love is part of the reason that Rachel Held Evans was so beloved because she gave people the ability to no longer deny these parts of themselves that were the ones that the church has too often said are not allowed. She made space for that, made a safe space for that. So one of the common refrains throughout the entire Bible, both in the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament, is fear not. Don't be afraid of what you think might happen to you. Don't be afraid to fail. But even more so, uh, don't be afraid uh, of the many expectations and limitations that are placed on us by our culture, our religion, our families. Um, don't be afraid of who you are. Don't be afraid of who God made you to be. Jesus says to Peter and to us, I believe in you, I know who you are, and I love you. And yes, you are exactly the disciple I need, the disciple the world needs 
for God to the world. Even if you don't think you're not Paul or Peter or whatever, God needs every one of us to be who we are created to be and to offer what we have for the world. Um, Julia is getting out the Cinco de Mayo follow song. I'm going to sing a verse of another song because I, I really debated about uh, which follow me hymn to sing. And because it's Cinco de Mayo, I went with Lord, you have come to the lakeshore. But there is a verse in another one of my favorites, 726. Don't worry, you just stay there. Just stay where you are. Um, will you come and follow me? Uh, 726, if you want to read the words, because they are so, so beautiful. And there's an, a verse in it that is particularly appropriate, and I am going to sing it to you. And if you've got it out and you want to sing along with me, you are totally welcome to do that. Okay? Because it's just so beautiful. So this, this whole song, this whole hymn, is Jesus talking to us. Which right? verse? Uh, oh, sorry. I think it's verse 4. Will you love the you you hide? Yeah. yeah. So that's it. Okay, so sing with me if you'd like to. And I'm probably going to pitch it lower because it's a little high where it is in the ball. So, uh, will you love the you you hide if I but call your name? Will you quell the fear inside and never be the same? Will you use the faith you find? shape the world around through my sight and touch and sound in you and you in me may we all get to the point where we can answer that question with a resounding yes through the grace and love and hope and mercy and justice and all good things of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
or come over. Come over. Come stand with me. Are you tired of all the attention yet, senior in high school? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you are. Well, we're just gonna we're just gonna talk about you for a little bit. Okay. So, you you were born here, is that right? Yes. I guess yes. I don't know. Okay, okay. Yeah. I mean, you have just lived your whole yeah. life in this area. Yeah. And um, Chris, as you may know, oh, gosh, you have been doing so much theater, mm -hmm. music. Uh, I mean, both vocal and, and instrumental. Yeah. Um, any, any highlights? Maybe we should have mom come up and tell the highlights. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. Uh, and, you, and you went to Pittsburgh, right? Yeah. You went to Pittsburgh. Did you get caught by the police swimming in that famous um, fountain? Yep, we did. Yes, yes, Indeed. you did. Yep, yep. That's a favorite memory of Sue and Jim. My husband Jim went on that trip too. Great yep. time. Um, yeah. You've, uh, yeah, you've just, just you've done a lot of things. And, and then the last year, um, you've been going to Cornell. Mm -hmm. So, because you were done with everything Lisbon had to tell you, Lisbon High School had to show you, except for music. Yep. Because all state jazz, yeah. right? Yep. That's yep. this week. That's this week. That's this week. Wednesday and Thursday. So, who has time for school, really? Is Honestly. what I, yeah, 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 yeah exactly. And just we're, we're all the things. The working at the bank. Yeah. Oh, working at the bank. See, I didn't I know this. Working at the, at the bank. bank downtown. Good. And you I ran, cross, I ran country cross country, country for, a for a while. Okay, what yeah. have I forgotten? What have I forgotten? Is that, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. <laughs> Just been an all-around good guy and upstanding citizen. Sure. Pleasant nice to be around. Merit scholar. Oh. oh, right. There's that little thing, too. National Merit Scholar. We don't, we don't have enough nice things to say about you, Chris, and you're just good, good people. So um, tell us... What, at this point, you think you shall, I mean, you know where you're going in the fall. I mean, yeah. what, if, if what you think you yeah. shall be doing. Uh, well, in the fall, I am headed to St. Olaf in Northfield, Minnesota, and I was accepted to their music program as a music major, uh, so I'm going to start off with that and a computer science double major and see where that goes. Hey, so who knows? Yeah. The practical and the, I don't know, is a music major practical or is just wonderful? It's just wonderful. Yes. I say this as an English major, people. I, I cast no stones. I was, a, I was an English major. Wonderful. Yeah. Good for you. Good for you. Well, we're super excited for you. Um, and we know that you will make a difference in the world because of the person that you are. Um, I, I, I give this... Uh, I give this little book out to graduates now. It's called World Changing 101, Challenging the Myth of Powerlessness. It's just some ideas about how you can go about changing the world. I know you already have been changing the world, but maybe this might have some new ideas for you. Awesome. Because um, we need your generation to help us. Help us do better, don't we? Yeah, yeah, you can, you can help fix our mistakes. So it's all on you, no, no all worries. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, we also have for you, uh, I mean, the real gift that we give is the, is the scholarship, the Ketix Dolezal scholarship. Mm -hmm. I haven't printed that out because we got a new copier on Friday, and my computer isn't printed up, this isn't hooked up, so we'll get it to you. I can, I'm, I'm going to send it to you. Okay. I'll just email it to you, and then you can print it out. And, uh, you know, it'll, it, it's not a huge amount of money, but it is a token of our love yeah. and our, our support. And... Uh, our good wishes. Helps. That's, everything helps. That's yeah. right. That's right. So um, I just wanted to do a blessing for you. I, I invite you guys all to extend your hands out to Chris. Put all the power of your love into your hands. All right. This is one of my favorite blessings. May the peace of Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness, protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again into our doors. And when that happens, we will rejoice with you and look forward to hearing all about what you do in this world and with your, with your good self. So, shall we, shall we, shall we clap for him? Okay. 
That's lovely, isn't it? That's lovely. We're in good hands. We have, everybody out there who works with kids knows, man, you guys are good, good people. We're, we're, we're in good hands. To praise God is to both give and receive. And gratitude for that which we receive from God who works upon within and between each of us in this gathered body, we open our hearts and our hands to give as we are able. Let us pray. Generous, gracious God, you bless us with life. You sustain us that we might live fully. You shower us with gifts that we might share your abundance freely. Accept our offerings of thanksgiving, love, and commitment. We offer them so that your name may be glorified and your love shared in this community and in this world. In the name of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We have Jonathan and the three carols <laughs> serving Camina today. <laughs> we needed two volunteers, and I just love the fact that the carols were. <laughs> From now on, when we need service, we're just going to put carol. <laughs> love it, love it, love it, love it. Uh, just a few reminders as we prepare to share this joyful feast of the people of God. Not just carol, but of all the people. Um, that this is the table of Jesus Christ. It does not belong truly to First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon. It belongs to Christ. And so if you love Christ and want to love Christ more, you are welcome at this table. It does not matter where you have been. It does not matter what tradition you come from. You are welcome at this table. Um, we serve by intinction. So our pairs of servers will be at the base of the steps. We invite you to come down by the center aisle um, from the front rows to the back, well, except the choir will go first. And uh, follow the choir. And uh, then you'll be handed a piece of bread 
and you will dip it into the cup. We have uh, both wine and grape juice. The wine is in the whitish cup and the gray is in the, uh, grape juice is in the grayish cup and either will impart the grace of Christ to you. And then when you have taken, you may return to your seat by the side aisles. And I'm also just going to mention that um, if anyone has need of gluten-free bread, please let us know, because we, uh, we have not heard that, but I, I also just, you know, sometimes people are afraid to say anything because they don't want to rock the boat. So don't deny your identity. It is okay. We will make room for you if we need, when we need to do that. So just let us know. <clears throat> Friends, come and see the gifts of God's love laid on this table waiting for you. Come and touch the gifts of God's love for you. Love as fresh as sliced baked bread, love as lively as wine on the tongue. Come and taste the goodness of God, broken open and poured out for you in Jesus' life and death. Come and share the goodness of God in Jesus' name. Wherever you've come from, whatever your age, come and know that all this is for you. Whoever you are, wherever you've been, Whatever you've done, all this is for you when you receive these gifts with all your heart, strength, mind, and soul. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. God who makes us wonder, maker of all that is, we bless you for every good gift in the world for snow and sunshine to make it sparkle, for starlight in the deep night sky, for seeds waking up as the spring comes closer. We bless you for food to eat and water to drink, gifts of this good old earth. We join our voices with these, all these amazing things to praise you for the life you give us. Jesus, you walk beside us day by day. It is so good to know that you lived a life like ours, walked in the sun, got tired, had sore feet. It's even better to know you enjoyed your food, sitting down with your good friends for a meal. You laughed and you cried, and you played with children in the town square. We thank you that you lived on earth and died on earth to show us how to find God in the middle of everything that happens. Here and now you meet us and feed us at this table, just as all your other friends around the world meet you at theirs. Holy Spirit, breath of God, breathe on us now and on these gifts of bread and wine. As we taste the bread, make us remember that God will always give us everything we need to live. As we sip our cups, make us remember that you are God's love within us to show how to share everything we have with neighbors in need and make the world a wonderful place to live in. As often as we eat bread or drink wine in Jesus' name, help us remember that your love will never let us go. Amen. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Take this to remember me. Jesus also said, I am the vine, you are the branches. This is the cup of joy. Drink from it, all of you, to remember Jesus. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Taste and see, friends, that God is good.
pray together. Loving God, your love is as close to us as our own hands and feet. People who need your love are as close to us as the people beside us, behind us, and in front of us. Send us now into your world to love each other, sure that you love us. Show us where we are needed and how we can make a difference so that the world will be a good place for all your people. We know this is what Jesus wanted. Help us live for Jesus wherever we go. Amen. Somebody celebrated a 50th wedding anniversary on Friday. It was Alan Becky Aaron. So congrats. Oh. <laughs> congratulations and best wishes for many more. Glad to celebrate with you. So uh, friends, hear these words of benediction as you head out there, remembering who you are and not being afraid of who God has created you to be and how God has created you to be and what God may be calling you to do. As Christ burst forth from the tomb, may new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. And may that same Christ who lives forever and is the source of our new life keep your hearts rejoicing and grant you peace this day and always. Amen. Amen.